Conservative leader Andrew Scheer appears to be cleaning house following last month's election loss. This weekend, he fired his two top aides in his office, his chief of staff, Mark andre Leclerc, and his communications director, Brock Harrison. Scheer blamed communication issues after failing to unseat the Liberal government last month. So will these moves take some of the heat off of Scheer's own leadership? Corey Tanaik is a former director of communications to Stephen Harper, now managing partner at Rubicon Strategy. He joins me now. Hi, Corey. Nice to see you. Great to see you, too. Our, our election power panelists back in action. Uh, let me ask you right off the top if you think that this move effectively addresses what you would identify as the problems within the party right now. No, I think it un underlines the problems. Uh, How so? Well, I think it's n normally replacing senior staff is something that's uh, uh, really the emphasis on the communications about who you're bringing in, uh, not about who you're getting rid of. Uh, but to replace your senior uh, staff with a stack of empty chairs uh, would seem to underline a bit of a decision-making problem, uh, which is, I think, uh, more fundamental. Uh, so it's a, it's a very unusual uh, move to dismiss your top aides and, and not have somebody there to replace them. Mr. Scheer, right after the election loss, I think after the first caucus came out and identified communications issues as the big problem in this election. Do you agree? Oh, I think it's a lot more than communications. I think there's uh, substantive issues uh, that we, uh, we've chatted about before, but uh, I think there was a, a framing of the election campaign uh, around uh, uh, the Prime Minister uh, about him not being as advertised, and then I think the campaign uh, went on to, to do a bunch of unforced errors, whether it's about Andrew's uh, citizenship or whether it's uh, about not being full and frank in answers to questions on social issues uh, that, that made it really seem like he might not be as advertised either. You know, was he an insurance broker or wasn't he? Vasi, this is a, a question for the Times. Like, we, we don't know. Uh, it took, you know, a three-day slow roll to find out what his resume was. Uh, so that, that speaks exactly to the The party to the at the time, though, was telling us all the time when we were talking about this, why are you talking about this? This is so dumb. This is so important, right? Well, the, the, the voters decide what's important and not right. important. And just saying that you think something is dumb doesn't mean that it's irrelevant to, to voters. So, I, and I think we're seeing another unforced communications error again in terms of this. Now, I appreciate that, that being asked if you want to be uh, Andrew Shear's chief of staff right now is probably like uh, asking someone if they want to be the captain of the Titanic. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a great honor if it's before it hits the iceberg, but after the iceberg, it's, you know, it seems more like a, a, a less of an honor and more of a hardship post. And are we after the ice break, uh, icebreaker, and why? Well, I think the I think the iceberg was was the election, and uh, uh, you know I think this speaks to to an ongoing series of uh, leadership challenges that uh, Andrew's having. Uh, I think uh, you know we'll we'll see how it plays out, but uh, it's uh, it's another error in my view. I should say uh, to fairly disclose that you were um, a part of Maxime Bernier's campaign. You advised him at least. I remember reading after that campaign, you wrote I think an op-ed and maybe the Sun. I, I hope I'm not wrong there, but saying identifying that you think you know the party should come together around Mr. Shearer. That was back in 2018. Yes. What do you think the party should do now? Uh, well, I think uh, I think they should go into a leadership selection process. I think that uh, we should uh, go about uh, having a full full blown leadership uh, selection process. Uh, I think that uh, for those who would like to see Andrew uh, Shear stay on, I think Andrew should make those uh, arguments uh, before the party membership and amongst a competitive field of candidates uh, and. Uh, uh, and how one gets the authority to lead the party into the next election is by having their leadership tested in a true way, not in a, a sort of a rigged convention process, but in a true leadership race. Do you think uh, by those comments that it will be rigged? It's always rigged. What does that mean? Uh, well, the, the people administering it are in a huge conflict of interest. They uh, set when the delegate selection meetings are, they set all the rules around it, they can put their finger on the scale in a very uh, undemocratic way. And uh, if history is to be a predictor of the past, uh, if the past is to be a predictor of the future, uh, then we'll see that again, because that's what we always see. Were you ever one of the people pulling those strings? Uh, I never worked in party headquarters during a leadership uh, race, so no. So if, it, if that is the case, do you think that there is that 
does the chance exist for the type of thing that you just described, a, 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 a truly competitive race to take Eighty percent of the time leaders resign. They don't go through some sort of party vote at a convention. They resign and uh, often, uh, you know, and, and they can resign and decide to run again. So, for instance, uh, Stockwell Day uh, technically passed a leadership test and decided that it wasn't uh, robust enough uh, support in the party and decided to have his leadership uh, stand and, and ran again. He, he lost to Stephen Harper, but that, that I think, is the honorable path forward. Uh, so you for think Andrew. Mr. Scheer should resign? Uh, I think he should resign and run again for his job. If he's confident that the party membership backs him, that's the way to test that. And what is your sense of what the party membership feels right now? Among uh, well, I, I, I don't want to prejudge that because we don't know what other candidates would uh, come to the fore. Uh, Are there any that you think uh, should be? Look, I, I think uh, any ca the candidates that would be the most interesting would never let their name stand uh, publicly uh, until there is actually an open race. And, and I think that's the way it would always be. But I'm sure that uh, there would be a very interesting field of candidates that would like to be the Prime Minister of Canada. And I think that the, the, uh, uh, this is a you know, being the leader of the opposition is. Uh, uh, a necessary stepping stone to getting that top job. I think there would be a lot of interesting people that come forward. To play devil's advocate, is there any sort of special consideration that should be given to the idea that we're in a minority government right now and to, to go through Mr. Scheer resigning and then a leadership race, like, could be a, have, a, have a detrimental effect on the health of the party going forward and its viability in the next election? Is, well, should there be any credence given there? Hanging on in the way that Andrew is is detrimental to the party. Why not just go straight to a leadership uh, review? Uh, rather to a leadership contest and, and skip the leadership review stage. Uh, I think that would be uh, the proper way if that was a concern. I think this is a very stable minority government. Uh, as we've seen in the past, the bloc never want to have an election. Uh, the NDP are flat broke. Uh, and the Conservatives are uh, uh, in going through the leadership uh, process that we're talking about right now. So I don't think any of the opposition uh, really want to have uh, an election right now. And I think that uh, uh, the Liberals just got elected and uh, why would they want to call a campaign right now? I, did, I just don't think it's realistic. One last question before I let you go and that's on the direction the party takes in the future. Obviously a ton of scrutiny over the decisions made, even the, the platform decisions made, the kinds of policies that they put forward and the issues around social conservatives. Do you think that the party needs to A, change its climate change policy, B, uh, more clearly express where it stands on, on those socially conservative issues? Like what do you think the party needs to do going forward? Well I think it, this is part of what comes out of leadership races is you have a bunch of different people with competing ideas and visions as to how to take the party forward and it always ends up being the leader who plays the most important role in sort of making those tough decisions. Uh, we know how uh, Andrew made those decisions, we know what the outcome of those decisions were and we know how they uh, uh, fared electorally. So maybe it's a good time to have some other pre people bring forward some ideas and we'll have a robust debate about those. Uh, but it's very, policy uh, is a very leadership driven process in every political party and the Conservative Party is no exception. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Corey. Great to see you as always. Thanks. Corey tonight. That was Corey tonight, former director of communications to Stephen Harper from a bit earlier on the show. He was reacting to conservative leader Andrew Scheer's house cleaning over the weekend. Scheer swept out his chief of staff, Marc-Andre Leclerc, and his communications director, Brock Harrison. Is that enough, though? Time for the power panel in Montreal. Yolande James, former Quebec Liberal cabinet minister. Over in Toronto, former director of policy to Stephen Harper, Rachel Curran. She's now with Harper and & Associates. And here with me, political commentator and former NDP MP, Francoise Boivin. And next to her, the CBC's own John Paul Tasker. Hi, everybody. Hey, Hi, nice to see you. Rachel, I have to start with you. <laughs> so so yeah. we were just saying before we went on air that Corey did not hold back uh, about his assessment. I guess, I mean, it, the question he's an he was answering, I believe, and the one I posed right off the top, and I'll pose to you as well, is if... This, what happened over the weekend, adequately addresses what needs to be addressed, what you would identify as needing to be addressed within the party and within Shear's leadership. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think Corey's comments were a little bit harsh. Uh, it, the, the requests or the demands from Andrew Shear were, show us what's going to change, show us how you're going to do things differently. If you want to stay on as leader, uh, you know, tell us how things are going to improve and change going forward. So I think this is clearly the first step 
uh, in sheer strategy to, to, to try and stay on as leader and to, to continue leading the Conservative Party, not just you know leading into the leadership review, but afterwards also. Um, is this enough? Is this all that needs to happen? Clearly not. Uh, but there was, I think, initially uh, some demands that he at least change up his senior staff, uh, that he really look at the people who were advising him and make some changes there. Uh, that was a request likely from caucus as well. Yeah. So it, it's one step in probably a number of steps that Andrew Scheer will be taking in his attempt to, to survive and to hang on as conservative leader. So I, look at this point. At this point, it seems like he can't win, right? Um, you know, if he doesn't change anything, if he doesn't get rid of anyone, the criticism is, well, you're just carrying on with the same strategy that failed before. On the other hand, if he does try and shake up his team and bring different people in and bring different advisors in, then he gets criticized for that too. So I have a bit of sympathy for him here. I think he is trying to make the changes that are being asked of him. I think he's trying to respond to caucus concerns. I think he's trying to respond to party members' concerns. So we'll see what else uh, he has to roll out. Yolande, what do you think? Um, I appreciate uh, Rachel really <laughs> trying <laughs> to help him out there. I really do. But I mean, not only are the gloves are off, or, let, let's just put it this way. If Corey Tonight's, um was the only one to, to speak the, his mind as to where Andrew, leader, uh, Andrew Shear's leadership stands, then maybe I would be willing to agree with Rachel, well, there's more to come and this and that, but it's cumulative. From the day after the election, there was the first opportunity for Mr. Shear to say, I got the message, not only through staff changes, but on the substance, these are the things that we're going to be ready to look at to make that change. He didn't do that. And that just created, uh, um, obviously, opportunity for a lot of frustrations, not just in Quebec. I think to the op-ed, the very strong Melissa Lantzman wrote last week mm -hmm. um, in just Rona for, Ambrose. Yeah, uh, for our viewers, uh, I'll just say that's Melissa Lantzman and Jamie Ellerton. They both wrote yes. an op-ed in The Globe basically saying that the Conservative Party, and specifically Mr. Shear, have to do more concrete, I guess, like more evolve evolve their take on uh, LGBTQ rights and they need to be more unequivocal about about them and where the party stands. Just to, just to help uh, our Just to, just to, to thank you. And Rona Ambrose coming out yeah. and, and, and supporting that. Um, it's just a more um, indication that party members, progressive parts of the, the Conservative Party are speaking out and I just don't see how Andrew Scheer at this point comes out of this. Um, um, obviously, with the intensity of the um, of, of those that don't agree with his leadership, so the, the, the intensity with which they're speaking out, and the lack of his supporters um, supporting him publicly rigorously, those two elements just indicate to me that his days as leader are numbered. Really, I don't see his how he's going to walk this back, be, in, in part because. Yes, there's communications, but there's, this, the, there's the issues, and he never um, addressed that. So It's an interesting point, Francois, that Yolande makes, specifically around there are many critics, there aren't a lot of defenders at this point. What do, what do you, I mean, at the same time, he's clearly planning on sticking around. He made this move exactly. in this week in that effort, right? So what do you think? Well, that's, that's the point. We can all say, I, I respected what Corey said. I respect what Rachel is trying to be a bit more diplomatic uh, than, than Corey. It was pretty direct, I must say. Uh, but but that being said, he, uh, he already made his, his, his bed, uh, Andrew Scheer, decide he didn't do what Yolande was saying that he should have done and what a lot of people thought he should have done. So now where do we go from there? So he's doing the next best thing, get rid of the, I'd say, the two top around him, which is his chief of staff, his director of communication. Now, who he will pick to, to, to replace those two guys will tell us a lot, and especially those who are opposing right now. If he goes to pretty much the same style, uh, it, will, it, it will show that he's not really going to change. If he brings some new blood with different ideas, it might be uh, back for him to the road of, uh, of better things. Um, I, I don't ever underestimate, in my opinion, Andrew Scheer. He battled. Maxime Bernier was one of the most organized guy and, and, and managed to beat him in his own province because it's the guys from the supply management that went to the rescue of Andrew Shear. So this guy's been around since 
I can remember politics uh, since I think he was probably five years old <laughs> and already <laughs> dreaming of it. I so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, um, he, he, I think he's no stupid. He knows what he has to, to change. And uh, he might listen and come to different things. And don't forget also, and I'll shut on this one, is the fact that right now there's nothing really happening. There's that's a, few yeah, that's meetings. That's what I wanted to ask. And it, it's like it, there's kind of a vacuum. But once they're in the house, there's the CN story going out when they they face maybe a back to work legislation or not? Yeah, they haven't really um, been like the, the, the liberals have dominated the agenda. It, exactly. Over the last so in the two next weeks, two yeah. weeks, the whole tune might change just because they will be busy doing other things. So uh, we'll see. The other question I had though, JP, was was also on the vacuum of leadership candidates mm -hmm. too, because while this whole discussion is going on and the idea of who could beat him becomes part of the discussion, I mean, there are the only name that came up before was Peter. McKay, and then he quickly re yeah. re retracted that yeah. possibility. What, what do you think? Well, I wonder if Corey might be working with someone who is interested <laughs> in running for the Potter, leadership Potter. because he wasn't just equating Andrew Shear's leadership to the Titanic. He was saying that Andrew Shear should step down right now and trigger mm -hmm. a leadership review immediately. And this is not some I guy who wonder, worked let in let me the interrupt mail room, you first. Right? Yeah, let me interrupt you and play that clip for, yeah. our, for our listeners. Take a listen. I think he should resign and run again for his job. If he's confident that the party membership backs him, that's the way to test that. Yeah, I mean, this is not some guy who worked in the mailroom, right? This was a senior conservative guy in the Harper years. He helped Doug Ford win the last provincial election. He stands for something, right? He's not just some person, some shadowy person. He He's actually a public-facing member of the conservative leadership. Although he did support levels, Maxime right? Bernier and, sure. and has was known to be at odds with the people who ran Shears' right. uh, campaign. Obviously, well. he feels like what they've but done still, now yeah. is just tinkering around the edges, yeah. that it's not just enough to replace the communications person who sat by while Andrew Shearer had questions about his resume and whether he's an insurance broker and if he's a U.S. citizen and all the things that we can list here that Brock Harrison and others in that office were responsible for, at least in part, or at least the response to those issues. Obviously, Shear felt that he had to have some fall guys in place. He had to pin the blame on somebody. We know caucus was very testy when they met a couple weeks ago. It went on for hours. They met far beyond the scheduled time. They weren't sitting around sharing recipes and singing Kumbaya, <laughs> right? They were taking it out on the leader, asking for some action. So he's trying to put something in the window, trying to give them something in return. But I think what we're seeing now is the likes of Corey and others who are saying, this is not enough. It's not enough just to get rid of some of the people who are around you in that campaign. You have to take the next step. You have to resign. And if you want the job, sure, go for it. Do what Stockwell Day did in 2000. Run again and see what happens. But it really, yeah, it really, yeah go ahead, Rachel. I want to get so, you. So let me, look, let me jump in here in all fairness to Mr. Shear. The Conservative Party really is a member-driven party. It is a grassroots party. And I've been very critical of Mr. Shear on certain issues, too, particularly on the LGBTQ front. Um, but, but, but let me say this, it's not a top-down party like the Liberal Party. I strongly believe that members of the Conservative Party should make the decision about who's going to be the next leader. I'm one member, I have one vote. Um, you know, and there are many thousands of other members who want to weigh in on that decision too. So, so Corey I think the, it's, can I ask you quickly though? Corey yeah. said that the the uh, process was pretty rigged. That especially when he goes to picking <laughs> delegates and who represents, like he was saying that the this leadership review that might occur in April won't really be a democratic process. That's what do you think of that? Said. Well, look, there's always those criticisms around delegated conventions. I mean, look, we'll see how that's handled. But ultimately, the members will have their voice. You know, the people who contribute to the Conservative Party, the people who volunteer on behalf of the Conservative Party, if they are not happy with the outcome in April, they're going to make that very clear. So the party only runs, um, the party, a party only has money, uh, the party is only a viable entity because of the individual Canadians and Conservative Party members who are supporting it. Uh, and I do believe that who the leader is should be their decision. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.